Rob went back outside and pumped the gas into the car. When it was as full as the $30 would allow, he pulled the car over into one of the parking spaces. The light was shining bright enough for him to read well, even though he wasn't directly under the bulbs anymore. He picked the book up off the passenger seat. It had been keeping the other book, with the drawing in it and the recyclable apple he had taken back from the hotel room, company. He barely looked at the book's covering. It was just a little bigger than Dr. Grazer's book. It was hardbound and black, but not shiny at all. It felt like skin in his hands. It probably was. He was an animal lover, but he really hoped it was an animal skin. It gave under his fingers a little. He flipped to the first page. There was no foreword, no dedication, no copyright notice, and no author listed. There was a title on brown and yellow stained paper. It read, Theory and Practice of the Cosianth Demon. Rob exhaled with relief. The entire book was going to be about them. He had gotten so many questions answered from Dr. Grazer before he had blown up at him, but that book was like getting the key to the kingdom. Betty said he never laid a hand on her, but Rob wondered if losing a treasure like that might finally force his hand. He hoped she would not be in too much trouble. Upsetting the household had not been his intention at all. They had been married a long time. They would survive a visit from Rob Barton. He put his thumb under the last page and let all the pages fall back to the beginning just to get a glimpse of the entire thing. A smell wafted up to his nose. It was a smell of old paper and dampness. It smelled like an entire library in one book. It was strong, but it was not unpleasant. It smelled like wisdom. On the next page there were chapters, but they were listed as lessons. They were handwritten in calligraphy. There was Lesson 1, History. Lesson 2, Ideology. Lesson 3, Dreams. Lesson 4, Rituals. Rob figured he would flip to that one first to see what was required. There was Lesson 5, Interbred. Lesson 6, Metamorphos. Lesson 7, Power. Lesson 8, Deflection. Lesson 9, Consumption. And Lesson 10, Demoniacs. There was another word that had been originally written underneath Demoniacs. Rob tilted the book to catch the light better to make it out. It was longer than the newer word over it. It was almost the same. It was Demoniacus. Rob wondered what the difference was. He flipped through several more pages. There was a glaring inconsistency in the way the book was made. Some parts were typed on regular typing paper. The handwritten parts were in all sorts of handwriting. The less legible stuff had been rewritten over to try and make it more readable. Other parts were written over to update the translation of the word. Rob understood that after he had seen enough examples in context. Some parts of the type had been stamped on, and somewhat crookedly. There were occasional illustrations also in varying styles. There were woodcuts and Xeroxes of old paintings and hand-drawn pictures, some not unlike what he was using as a bookmarker in the other book. Some of the pages had been torn and taped back together. It was like a scrapbook from a very morbid family on a very morbid subject. The book had no page numbers. He flipped through, finding the heading for each lesson, until he found the one he was looking for as a starting point. Lesson 4 was just less than halfway through. It was one of the typed sections. It began with paragraphs about what the rituals could be used for. Rob already knew all that. He flipped frantically through a few more pages, not knowing what he would do if he did not find exactly what he was looking for. Suddenly on a page all by itself was a list. He glanced through it. It was exactly what he had hoped to find. It did not seem like an impossible list. He was feeling a new fear come over him, that it was really going to happen. It really just might work. He knew himself well enough to know that there would be no backing down. He was going to do it. His only remaining question was if it really would work, or if it was just a more intricate version of Hocus Pocus. The possibility was right there before him. He needed to act on it. He went through it a few more times to make sure the steps were all plausible for him to do. He could not find any unattainable steps or ingredients. He would be able to do it. There were a few supplies he needed that were not all listed in the ceremony. He would need a blade. That one was to be used in the ritual. He needed lighter fluid and a lighter. He wanted to make a fire. That was not part of the book's list. He wanted some more food that would keep without a fridge, which meant more non-perishable junk food. When it was all over, all of it, not just the performing of the spell, he hoped he would be in the position to send up a flare. He would need to buy a flare gun and the flares for it. That would attract the attention he would need to advance to the next step in what felt like an endless plan. To keep from feeling overwhelmed with it all, he was taking it one step at a time. The next immediate step to act on was shopping. Most of that would have to wait until the following day, when more stores were open. As attainable as the ingredients that the recipe called for were, some of the items might require going to a specialty store. 
He hoped one was in the area, just in case. He continued flipping through the book while being careful with some of the more fragile pages. Some of them felt like they would disintegrate if he turned them too hard. He felt rushed. He had so much to go through in such a short time. He would have to do a cram session right there in the gas station parking lot, shop the next day, and hopefully be ready to perform the ceremony by the time that night fell. He would then summon that son of a bitch again with all his might. He would antagonize the hell out of him until he wouldn't be able to resist. Rob hoped he would just stay at bay until he was ready for him. He would get himself lost before he went through the ritual. He hoped that would buy him the time necessary. Lesson One's history section was intriguing. Rob was reading all that he could at breakneck speed. He hoped he would be able to retain at least half of what he was flying through. It told of the warring Norse Viking clans that Dr. Grazer had discussed with him. Another unnamed clan had beaten down the Skilfings. A woman named Inga, of Kosianth ancestry, had summoned and merged with the being that she had brought forth. She gave birth to a baby boy only a few months later. He was named Odin. When he was still a small child, he was directed to perform the activating ceremony. Within a year, he had transformed into a powerful creature. Rob examined the illustration on the opposite page. It was a bulbous and ferocious little creature that had been drawn. It was in mid-leap, in attack mode, lunging with its hands clenched open and ready to strike. There were no fingernails. It was bald and naked. Its eyes were tiny beads deep in their sockets. There were small nostrils drawn. Its little mouth was open in a feral snarl. Tiny, jagged teeth were gnashed. It had no apparent genitalia. Rob took it to be an artist's interpretation of an old legend. It had to be an exaggeration. He did not believe that mixing together a few ingredients and saying a few words was really going to make his dick drop off. He wanted to follow the steps to access a powerful state of mind that maybe had a mystical element to it. Mind over matter might actually make him stronger if he was able to believe in it enough. That might give him just enough of an edge to survive, and maybe to win. The book went on in the next pages of the lesson to say that the old monster Grindel, from the epic Beowulf poem, might itself be a half-breed. There was another artist's rendering of that creature, along with a wood carving of a Kosianth demon, and there were indeed similarities. Grindel was shown as large and muscular, and its features were indistinct. However, it had large claws. That was incongruent with what Rob knew of the demons, and of the killer. When he had been in the killer's body and driving the truck, he had stared at his hands on the wheel. They were massive, but there had barely been any fingernails. It seemed to be an unimportant detail, but one he had noticed. The depiction of the long, sharp nails was making Rob question the validity of the entire book. Maybe it was going to turn out to all be bullshit and a waste of time and energy. The book went on to say that Grendel's mother may very well have been an activated person who was going through the transformation at the time of her mating with a Kosianth demon. She was becoming a monster herself while mating with one. That could account for the extra deformities in the creature's offspring. Reproductive abilities were assumed to fade away when the transformation began, but that theory suggests that there may be a time in which breeding is still an option and the child could be carried to term. The term of gestation for a half-breed was about half the time of a normal human. The book also added that it is speculated that Grindel, and its mother, may be descendants of the biblical Cain. Although Rob found the implications of these creatures being linked as far back and in relation with Cain profound, he felt he was starting out way off track. He had read Beowulf in high school's English class, but that was a fictitious story. Even with what all Rob had gone through himself— he could not believe in such an outrageous story as being an actual account of a man's epic journey. Maybe the anonymous author had done very successfully what Dr. Grazer had tried to do. That someone had incorporated the truth into a published story and had gotten information out there. Not only had they gotten it out there, but also it was in one of the most famous stories of all time. The more ethereal revelations had never been obvious to Rob, and he had already had plenty of encounters by the time he was in high school. He had never made any connection— he wondered if the truth had been altered too much, or if some important elements had gotten lost in the translation. He wondered if it was all just bored scholars reaching for connections that weren't really there. He wasn't finding Lesson 1 to be relevant to his current state, so he moved on. Lesson 2's ideology section wasn't much more helpful. It went into a lot of things that Dr. Grazer had already discussed with him. For the first time since he had left that man's house, he felt grateful to him. He was grateful to his wife for the book. Finally, he could be thankful for his time with that man for hurrying up the reading part of the process. He skimmed through the entire section that went through ways to summon the demons and their suspected hierarchy and rules that they had to abide by. He would have been much more fascinated if he hadn't already heard it before. He was quickly on to lesson three. The dream section was more abstract, 
with lots of illustrations and copies of surrealist paintings and seemingly random imagery. It was the trippier section of the book. Rob didn't have time for it. He passed by the fourth lesson, since he had already studied it enough to know it had what he needed, and he was on to the fifth. The interbred section was about the mixing of the species with the human race. It went through various women of Kosian descent's stories and the different ways and reasons they summon the creatures. Rob came across Inga of the Skilfing clan again. He continued flipping through the pages and through the ages, past the tribal women, until he came upon the Victorian age. That section had a very interesting Xerox of a painting. Rob wished he could see it in all its original color and splendor. The arrangement of fine black dots on a piece of paper would have to suffice. It was a Rubenesque painting of a woman, bent back over the lap of one of the demons sitting on a plush bed. The woman's head was just above the floor, with her arm thrown across her face in a passionate pose. She was biting her lower lip, and her eyes were rolled back. Her flowing white nightgown was pulled up and lay rumpled on her torso. She was exposed from the waist down. She had no pubic hair. The creature had its first two fingers inside her, up to the knuckles. Its other arm was under her shoulders, supporting her. It was very sensual and creepy at the same time. There was a talicized type below the picture of the painting. It read, An unknown artist portrayal of a sexual episode with a demon. The book had a commentary on the painting on the following page. It was a handwritten section. It said that the demons were not known to have any genitals from any documentation from interviews with women who supposedly had sexual relations with the demons. None sprang forth in the act. The fingers were the only penetration that occurred. It was unknown exactly how their seed was spread. They are depicted as smooth. There are no pores believed to be anywhere on their bodies. Their skin is impenetrable. A human woman cannot be impregnated without some sort of insemination. There was no fluid found in any examination, and no subject felt anything but warmth. The theory of openings in their fingertips was preposterous according to the science journal in the book. The subjects had agreed. The exact nature of what occurred remained, and probably will always remain a mystery, the scientist journal concluded. Rob couldn't believe what he was reading. There had been experiments done. Dr. Grazer had been so sure that they could not be manipulated for information, but humans could. Why had he not mentioned any of that part of the book to him? Rob presumed they could have continued chatting over the subject for days and still not covered everything. He guessed that women had been used to summon the demons privately, and when the demons came, on their own terms, and in their own time, and did their thing, that the women would report back with what had happened. Some women out there had given up their bodies to a horrific experiment. How many had given birth? Were any of those children examined? The children of such experiments would not be of a diluted bloodline that had accidentally trickled out into everyday society. They would be exactly half and half. Surely an opportunity to explore that couldn't be passed up. Rob read on, but there was nothing about any of the children, if any had been born. He continued through the following sections on metamorphos and power. They discussed the transformation process and the abilities gained. That was of much importance to him. It described the mutation to expect right after performing the ritual to unlock the dormant cells. The word mutation scared Rob. He tried to shake it off and think of it more along the terms of what a superhero in a comic book must go through after they fall into a vat of toxic waste or come into contact with an extreme dose of radiation. He tried to, but he couldn't take it that lightly. He was terrified of losing himself, but he reminded himself that it was just going to be a step for strength. He had been worried that he wasn't going to be able to buy into all the ceremonial aspect enough for the mind-over-matter factor to work. He was relieved to find that not only was he buying into it, he was afraid it might work too well. The book went into more immediate after-effects of the spell. The word spell seemed a little silly to him. He tried to turn down the concerned and skeptical feelings of Peg in order to go on through constructively, without his brain constantly keeping him from absorbing what he was reading and distracting him by screaming at him to stop before he made things worse. He argued with himself that they couldn't get worse. He was being targeted by an inhuman monster, and he could combat it, or he could die, and let countless others die after. The killer would keep going after Rob. Of course he would. It was who and what he was. That was not what Rob was. Rob knew that. He would be different. He would be better. He would be stronger, and if it came time for him to use that strength to harm others, then he would take his own life. He would be free to die in a way he chose, and on his own terms. That would be an improvement from where he felt he was standing. Things could not get worse. 